Hello and welcome to the Point of Leadership podcast number six and today I'm delighted to be joined by Joe Owen, author of one of the best if not the best book on leadership that I've ever read, How to Lead, uh, first published around about Joe, 2008, 2009? Might have been even slightly earlier, 2006, something like that. Or oh my gosh, okay. We'll do you a dis- Dating myself there, but there we go. Uh, seriously, great book. And don't read it once, you've got to read it several times just to take in the real stuff. There's so many books on the marketplace about leadership and management. This one will make a difference to you. So, Joe, thank you for joining us. Delighted to be with you, and thank you for having me on your podcast. I'm really excited about today. I've got a few questions, but, you know, let's see where this goes. And um, hopefully it's going to be as interesting to the audience as it is to me, because I'm super excited to get your view on the world and life and, of course, on leadership. I wanted to start with the first question, uh, you know, driving into work today, and I was thinking about you know, the challenge of leaders about getting stuff done you know, if we don't get stuff done, I guess we don't need leadership. And some, some would say, what's your view on getting stuff done in today's world? You know, making things it's interesting, that, isn't it? I mean, that, at first sight, that's one of those really stupid questions, like, you know, Isaac Newton, you know, why, why, why don't, why do apples fall downwards? Why don't they sort of float upwards or shoot out sideways? Actually, it's a really good question. The apples question was a really good question because that revolutionized modern the modern world but yeah how do you get stuff done because mm. actually what's happened is the way managers get stuff done has changed because in the past managers leaders made things happen through people they controlled basically in a hierarchy um orders went down and information went back up more or less reliably okay kind of simple world for those at the top uh, and simple and clear for people at the bottom, but maybe not entirely comfortable. They made things happen through people they controlled. Now you have to make things happen through people you don't control. That changes everything because you can no longer rely on command and control. You have to be build commitment You have to build your network of trusted allies. You have to get people to want to work with you. So you have to make things happen through colleagues who may well be your competitors because they're competing for that same limited pot of management, time, money, and attention. So how do you make things happen through your colleague competitors, through other departments, through vendors, through uh, other stakeholders? How do you get all of those people sort of aligned behind your agenda, supporting you and wanting to work with you? So that's a completely different world. The old world was fairly simple, you know, pretty rational, you know, tell people what to do, be clear about the smart goals and all that kind of good stuff, right? The new world is much it's still got the rational stuff. You still need to be able to do that. But now you're dealing much more with emotion and politics. The emotion is you know, the one-to-one. How do, how do I build that trusting relationship with each colleague? And it's political because it's about trying to align very different and competing agendas so that the organization you work for begins to work for you. That's that's really made the whole management task much, much, much harder, but actually much more rewarding. Because in the past, your power and influence was limited basically by your formal power, by your span of control and your budget. That defined your power and influence. Well, you, the modern manager has broken free of those shackles because if you just rely on your formal authority of budget control, span of control, and decision and decision making rights, you're going to be a very ineffective manager. You can now break through it free and amplify that formal power massively by building your informal power 
through your network of influence across and beyond the organization. You can achieve far more than you ever achieved before. But behind that, we're discovering there's a new currency of leadership. Because the old currency was all about formal power, the new currency, informal power, and the essence of informal power is to become the trusted colleague. So let's just dig into that for a moment. Machiavelli, um, writing for the prince uh, in the 16th century, asked perhaps the most famous question of leaders, which is, is it better to be feared or loved? Yes. And he concluded that actually being loved is weak because uh, he, he said men are fickle and disingenuous and they'll love you <laughs> um, uh, to your face, but the moment danger appears, they'll run away. He didn't say anything about women, but I presumed they'd be far better, but um, in his world, they didn't count. So hopefully we've moved on from that. And he was right. Love is fickle. Being popular is fickle. It is weak. Okay. So he goes on to recommend a few sort of salutary executions to sort of keep the uh, population in check. Not that Leaders do that, except, of course, when a new boss comes along, they'll often sort of yes. rearrange the top team and a few top team members go. So it's a sort of corporate execution, isn't it, really? But anyway, we don't talk about that. Um, about that. That is the classic power goal. But actually, if you're simply ruling by fear, that's also really unhelpful in this new world. Toxic. Okay. Toxic. So what you need is a new currency, which is currency of trust. So that's easy to say, oh, you know, I'm the trusted colleague. And of course, we all think we're trustworthy. Everyone right? will say they're trustworthy. You know, of course, we'll say we're trustworthy. Yeah, hey, trust yeah. me, okay? Trust me. But if I say trust me, I'm going to sound like a second hand car salesman. Yeah. So immediately, uh -huh. everyone will trust me, okay? Or even worse, I'll sound like a politician. In fact, Tony Blair said when he was being interviewed on the Today programme about the dodgy dossier, he said, fuck John, John Humphrey. Yeah, trust me, I'm an honest sort of bloke. And you can yeah. hear immediately over going, I don't trust him, okay? Yeah. So how do you build trust? And it, actually, here's a problem, because we judge ourselves by our intentions, which are, of course, always know. So, of course, we know we're trustworthy. We judge others by their actions. We judge them, yes. which is a lot more unforgiving. Yes. Because they may have tended to be, you know, their intentions may have been good, but if they don't deliver, we don't trust them. Okay? So trust, how do you build it? Before you do, before yes. you do, trust or popularity. I mean, I think a lot of people are seeking to be like, okay. you know, the most likes on Facebook. Or... Popularity is incredibly weak. Look, putting the bowl of candy by your hot desk, you know, people will come by and be very nice to you. But, I mean, th that is not how you're going to become the trusted and respected leader. Why would people want to work with you? Why will people compromise on their agenda to support your agenda? Why will they help you when you're in a hole? Why, why will they give you that advice you need? Why, yeah. They're not they agree. Really I, can't, I can't put an argument against this, Joe. I agree. Right. But so, so many managers are seeking popularity to be liked. It, it, and it's like, and there are gonna be times where you're gonna to have to discover the dark side of leadership. Okay, so let's just talk about that for a moment. Um, one of my books is about the mindset of success, where I outline the seven positive mindsets that all the very best leaders have, and we can learn them all. I'm not going to talk about them now, but there's one mindset. And, and if I just wanted to be a normal populist author, I'd just focus on the seven yes. positive mindsets and say how wonderful everything is, and leaders are beautiful, yes. wonderful, yes. And, da, 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 da. and it misses it. Yes because there is actually a dark side that all the best leaders have. And that dark side, the dark mindset, is ruthlessness. Now, every leader I interviewed said, oh, no, no, I'm not ruthless, okay? Maybe I've got a hard edge, but... So I said, well, you know, just tell me a couple of stories about your hard edge. And, you know, here's one story, just to give you an example. True story. Just one story, right? True and story. True story. Yeah, yeah, I can't make these up. I, I, I'm not creative enough. Okay. So as a head teacher, and she joined the school as a bright eyed young graduate, um, new teacher, alongside somebody else, right? And these two uh, teachers, basically, they, they followed the same career in that school. 
um they got both got married they both had children uh they'd go and have sunday lunch you know families would have sunday lunch with each other you know they'd go on holiday together so they're very very close okay and then you know roll the movie forwards 20 years later one of the two you know they're both heads of department and then one of them gets promoted uh to be head teacher okay great fine so the new head teacher looks around the school and goes well you know what have we got to do to take the school to the next level there were quite a lot of things but it was also clear that actually there was one department that was really holding the school back and it was a critical department it was english okay because and if kids don't get literacy then that's a gateway subject they're not going to get anything else okay and the problem was the head of the department so it was clear the head of the department had to go so if i come in goodbye who was that head of the department it was the person that she'd been with for 20 years okay so she just put aside 20 years of friendship family friendship end of all the holidays end of the sunday lunches blah, blah, blah. oh no i'm not harpers i is it i i told this story anonymously when i was at a teach first teach first conference um and immediately there was some tittering from the back and i said sorry what's that about i said I think I know who that is. No. <laughs> it was so recognisable as a person. Um, I hadn't said the name or the school, but it was completely recognisable as a person. So, and, and that was one person who said, I'm, I'm not ruthless. I'm not ruthless. Now, let's understand that ruthlessness. That's not being a psychopath. There are psychopaths who are just ruthless and nasty about everything. Where does that ruthlessness come from? It comes from being totally focused on a mission. Right? If we're going to say, right, we're going to climb that mountain, we will climb that mountain. No, we're not going to go fishing in the river. We're not going to go jointing over those hills over there. That's the mountain. And if you want to go fishing in the river, that's fine. But you're no longer with us. Okay. It's that total mission focus, mission clarity. You're not doing it be nasty or unpleasant mm. you're doing it in the case of the head teacher because she realized that the, the lives of hundreds of children every year were more important than the friendship of one person courage as well they take well that is another of mindsets as it happens that is another mindset right. which i first discovered from my work with the tribes so we can talk about that more another time but when I looked at tribal leadership, you know, one of the big values that comes out is courage. Not entirely surprisingly, but we, you know, why that is is another matter. So when I was doing the research on on mindsets, sorry, you know, avatorial mindset for success, yeah. um, I was doing structured research and I was inviting people to choose from about thirty mindsets, and I put courage in there just because I thought, well, it's from the tribes, but really. no one's going to pick it. Guess what? It consistently came out in the top three or four expect, you know, mindsets that uh, leaders talked about. So why do leaders need courage? Because they, it's not about trying to deal with wild animals or, or yeah. the neighbor tribe with all their Kalashinkovs, as they call them, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you need courage to have the difficult conversation. You need courage to make the difficult decisions. You need courage to try new things because you're going to fail sometimes if you try new things. You need courage actually to learn. I mean, a, a little sort of aside here. I, I discovered this. I, I decided to learn to swim properly. Okay. Everyone can swim, but I wanted to swim properly, you know, bilateral breathing and all that. And when I did so, I discovered. I had to go all the way back to basics. So I became the prat in the pool who was sort of flailing around and just complete bloody idiot, right? <laughs> Any courage to just say, okay, I don't, I, I don't care that everyone's going to think I'm an idiot because mm. I know what I want to achieve. Mm. I'm going to get there. And I, yeah. So even learning takes courage. Now, the good news is courage can be learned. Okay. Big surprise. So I was talking about this with one group 
And someone at the front said, oh, they said, courage, they can't learn courage. I said, well, mindset's like, oh, that's a difficult question. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, at the back, there's the chief of the local fire service. So I said to him, well, you know, your firemen do brave things like going to burning buildings to save people. So, you know, how, how do you get them to be, do such brave things? So he gets up, oh, so I sense the sixth cavalry coming over the horizon to save me. <laughs> And he says, right, first thing I want everyone to know is I don't want a brave farmer because a brave farmer is a dead farmer and that's no use to me. And I face palm and like, this is not going well. Yeah. So I go, okay. So look, how do you get them to do things that you know, we would think are brave? He said, oh, that, that, that's easy, yeah, going into burning buildings and all that. Look, let, let me tell you how we do it. You know, day one, when they arrive, we instruct them how to put on the basic kit. You know, day two, maybe a bit more sophisticated kit. Day three, maybe we'd learn... Let, let them put out a fire in a chip pan. You know, day four, we may uh, get them to learn how to use a step ladder properly. And then eventually, you know, the kit becomes more sophisticated, the fire has become more complicated, and the ladders become longer and, and so on and so forth. And eventually, you know, they are doing things that you think are brave, but are actually like another day in the office to them. That's interesting. So they make it routine. They make it routine. So again, I, I then went to see the Royal Marines um who have a private railway stop so you have to ask the train driver to stop which is always an interesting thing so i spent some time with them and guess what it's exactly the same yeah how, the royal marines are, are, are the ones who always go in first to the most difficult complicated ambiguous situations and it's exactly the same their pre-service fitness training starts with running one mile in i think eight minutes nine minutes now even granddad can do that on a good day okay and at the end of 18 months they're doing this epic and heroic stuff but always it's this very graduated learning yeah. with a lot of support a lot of coaching a lot of directed okay so it's all learned and it is all context specific. So again, I was speaking to a wonderful explorer who's done, you know, spent a year on the ice pack in uh, in, in the Arctic. He's you know, crossed the empty water in Saudi Arabia, done all the sorts of things that crazy explorers do. Um, I was asking about you know, how he learned to do all this stuff. And again, it's to him, it's routine. Yeah, living on the ice pack, living in the middle of the desert. Yeah, he, he knows what he's doing is fine. But he said, look, yeah, whatever you do, don't ask me to sell double glazing because I wouldn't last a week. <laughs> right? So this is all context specific. Mm -hmm. But the good news is, yeah, all these habits of mind we can learn. So we were talking about what's the currency of leadership. Yeah, you know, how how do you make things happen through people you don't control? Mm. And the answer is you need to be the trusted colleague. Ultimately, it's not popularity and it's not fear, it's trust. Okay. So how do you build trust? Um, I've broken this down into the trust equation. The maths is complete meadow mayonnaise, so don't worry about that. Uh, but it's simply a useful way of thinking about the different elements of trust. So trust is a function of social alignment, A, old alignment, G, credibility c and selflessness s all offset against risk because the greater the risk the more trust you need okay so i may trust a stranger in the street to tell me the way to the post office i'd be unwise to trust that stranger in the street with my entire life savings okay so just risk like, has an effect on trust and we can talk about how actually good leaders manipulate risk because all risk is relative, right? So, um, for instance, if I invited you to spend uh, a, a night in an open boat in the middle of the North Atlantic in the middle of winter, you probably decline my offer because it's not yeah, like really do I want do I really want to do that? No, okay. Um, however. There are a lot of very posh, very posh, first class type people huh. who were desperate to do this, take up this offer. Why? Because they were on the Titanic. Right? Yeah. So risk is relative. Yeah. 
risk is relative and good leaders use that to their advantage. Let's talk about the other four. Social alignment. Okay. It's a lot easier to trust people who are like ourselves as we understand them, which incidentally is a disaster for diversity. We can get onto that another time. But actually, human nature, we, we gravitate towards people we kind of know and trust because we we understand what they're saying and we understand what they're not saying. Kindred okay. spirits. Kindred spirits. So one of the jobs you have to do is actually build that social alignment and become liked. Okay. And how do you do that? The simple answer is just go and talk to people. Actually, even better, don't go and talk to people. Go and listen to people. <sighs> yeah. Right? The best leaders all have one characteristic in common. Absolutely universal. I can guarantee you this. This is the characteristic. They have two ears and one mouth. Oh, and they use them in that proportion. Okay. The leaders don't talk the whole time, which is why I'm not a leader. I'm talking all the time. Yeah, they listen at least twice as much as they talk. So if you want to build the social alignment, just let someone talk about themselves. Let them talk about their favorite subject themselves okay and you will find out all sorts of interest everyone has a story to tell everyone's interesting listen to them respect them and they will love you okay but what i'm seeing in leaders these days just to sort of build on that is <clears throat> less confidence in the conversation more focus on just doing stuff and um Fill in the silence. Yes. Yeah. You have to have some silence, right? You have to have that moment, that pause, just yeah. what's being said. But I'm finding people less able or less willing to do that these days. Yeah. I, and, you know, that's a. Well, that people think that if you're a leader, you have to be so bold and sort of, yeah. you know, making speeches and telling people what to do. It's like, no. Um, so. In my research, I was interviewing uh, someone who is the world's self-confessed worst EA, self-confessed world's worst EA, executive assistant, um, who then eventually became general counsel of a global uh, software firm, large global software firm. So how did that happen from lowly EA to general counsel he said well yeah I, I just built all these networks of trust and all that so how do you do that well she said, every, every time i went anywhere on holiday or wherever else I, i'd go to ireland and yeah you know, i'd just call in on the office and i'd just meet people yeah you know, i was an ea so i'd be talking to all these people on the phone yeah. and then you know if i actually went I was on holiday one. I'd just go into the office and say hello to everyone because I, I, you know, there were names. And of course, they were all amazed that I'd be coming in. And suddenly the quality of the relationship would be so strong and they'd do anything for me. And I'd understand them. So it's really simple stuff. I just That's nice. go and see people, talk to them, have a cup. Yeah. This is the teabag theory of leadership that there is no. Yeah, there is no problem on earth that can't be solved over a cup of tea. So just, you know, go and have tea or coffee if you want with, with whoever, right? So build that social alignment. Um, and people sort of get it. I mean, that's what the, the, the entire corporate entertainment business is built on. But that's very forced and very manufactured. Yeah, just do the human stuff. Just you know, five minutes with someone, just being nice to them, listening to them. The idea of popping into an office is authentic, isn't it? And that word is overused, but they're not doing it because they've been told to do it. They're not no. doing it because it's in their diary to do it. They're doing it because they have the opportunity and they've taken yep. time to do it. Incidentally, this is where you know, remote working is a challenge for people. Because when you're in the office, you can have all those serendipitous, oh, I can't, I've said that word, amazing, serendipitous uh, yeah. conversations. Um, and you can build that human contact and you can talk about cats and dogs. It's, in theory, you can do it online. 
in practice, it's much, much, much harder. So, um, yeah, we can talk separately about you know, hybrid working, but but I think yeah, that, that is one of the things you need to think about. So you don't need to be in the office all the time, but you do need to be in the office often enough that you're able to build those relationships and also so that you know what's happening or happening so that you, you know when the Death Star project and Death Star boss is approaching and you know where you know, the brilliant project and brilliant boss is and you can navigate your way appropriately. Um, yeah, because if you're in the office, you'll get early warning of that normally. Yeah. Uh, and you'll have, and you're able to control the narrative about you know how you're perceived, et cetera, et cetera. And being you know, you'll be in the information flow and gossip flow much more than if you're remote. Um so I so say you don't have to be in the whole time, but you need to be in enough that, you, that, that you're on top of that. So look, we're on trust. Let's talk. So we've done the social alignment. Yeah. Like, be nice. Right? Simple as that. Just be nice. Be nice? Be nice occasionally. Say thank you. You know, stuff like that. Okay. It's tough, but, you know, say oh. thank you. Uh, whatever, you know. Be human. Be, be human. Be human. I mean, I, I really hard, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Second bit. Really tricky bit. Goal alignment. Bold. This is Yeah. So... Yeah, you're working in an office, yeah, marketing, finance, sales, operations, we've all got different agendas, different priorities. We all have, okay? Different business units have different priorities, different geographies have different priorities, and they're all competing for the same limited pot of management time, money, and attention. So actually your biggest competition as a manager is not in the marketplace. It's a total. Your biggest competition are your colleagues. Because they're the people that are going to steal that management time, attention, money, and the next promotion. Okay. But they're the people you need to work with. So, how do you get that goal alignment across everyone? And this is where you know, inevitably this it is political and it's emotional and there's horse trading and it's tit for tat. You have to be able to give as well as take. So there are plenty of people out there, we all recognise in the office, who are just takers, okay. right? Yeah. Macho takers. And they can do quite well for quite a lot of time, but they land up building a lot of enemies and eventually they fall flat on their face. So in this new world, it's quite interesting. Actually, givers will inherit the earth because they're the people that others will be prepared to work with because they'll realize, okay, you know, they're wanting some help on this, but I recognize they have helped me on this in the past. Power of reciprocity is huge. Um, and that whole tip for tat, it's not even quite tip for tat because that sounds quite transactional. It yes. is a belief that actually these people are kind of good people. They're givers, not just takers. I can work with them. They're doing so it because they can, not it. because they expect to get something in return. It's like they, they kind of trust you that, you know, it, it is a two-way relationship. It's fine. And we're, we're going to be reasonable about it. And, yeah. you know, I don't know how it's going to come back, but it'll come back to me in a good way at some point. It's fine. Do you know, we have a client. Uh, his name's John. I won't give his surname. Yeah. He's a lovely guy. And I meet him from time to time. And he'll always say, Mike, what can I do for you? And he's our client. Right. right. And it's not like, you know, can I give you more business or anything? He's not in that position. Right. He works in a client company. But he's genuinely open to the ideas of, you know, maybe he can introduce us to someone or help us in some shape or form. And it's just like, oh, my gosh. Rarely do people ever say that kind of thing. So you've just given the classic description description of a giver not a taker yeah. and the classic reaction to a giver not a taker like this is someone you want to work with uh, I, I would hot calls and and you'll probably recommend him to other people and all yeah. that sort of stuff yeah. so th this so that goal alignment is huge and obviously there's a bit where, where there is a very hard edge you know we've, we've got competing agenda blimey how do we how do we actually work this out 
and you need a lot of creativity. And guess what? You, you again need to revert to the tea bag theory of leadership. You need to sit down, cup of tea, work it out. Okay. And you need to be creative. And it's the old thing. You need to focus on interests, not positions. You need to figure out, okay, what, what do you really need to achieve here? What do I need? And, and, and you come together. We can talk more about that later, but yeah, but that's that's sort of negotiation theory and all that kind of good stuff. So, right. We talked about trust. You need the social alignment. You need the goal alignment. That's two of them. You also need credibility. Um, yeah, you, you're not going to trust people that basically can't deliver, right? So you have to be able to do as you say, at which point all professionals go, well, oh, I always do as I say. Well, of course I do. Yeah. Do you? Okay. This goes back to what we were saying before. We trust, we 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 judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions. Okay. So let's just paint a little situation. Someone comes along to you and asks for a favor. Okay. And you go, and because you're a good professional, you go, okay, look, I'll tell you what, I'll look into it, I'll see what can be done, I'll do my best. Yep. Yep. You're not promised. That it's going to happen, but you just said, you know, I'll look into it. I'll see what I'll do my best. That's what you said. What's been heard, guess what's been heard? I'll do it. I'll do it. All right. So two weeks later, this person comes out and says, well, you know, how about it? He said, well, you know, I looked into it. I saw what was possible. And, uh, but, you know, sorry. Bang. All credibility gone. And you're at this point, you can now get into the I said, you said, you meant, I meant, he did, he said, no, you didn't. And that just makes it worse. Yeah. Okay. So for professionals, it normally isn't the doing that is the problem, it's the saying. Okay. So what that says is you, you have to be real, it's better to have a difficult conversation at the beginning than an impossible conversation at the end. Be really brutal, really brutal and really clear about setting expectations at the start. So there is no room for ambiguity and make sure that that has been understood. Okay, Because if it's not, you're going to be judged not on your very worthwhile intentions, but on your actions. And it's going to be a brutal judgment. Okay, So that credibility bit, kind of obvious, but it isn't obvious. And then finally, the whole selflessness bit. Um, Just before you do the selflessness, yeah. I always look in the work that we do for the stuff that's counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah. Because the intuitive stuff, people can generally work out themselves. I really like that last point, Joe, about having that honest, brutal kind of conversation at the start about expectations and about what you can and can't deliver. It's counterintuitive. I think we always say, yeah, I'll see what I can do because it's... Yeah, because we want to be nice. We want to be helpful. Nice. We're professional. On, We're nice people. Earlier on, you said be nice. Yeah, I know. And then we overdo it and it's like... Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, a lot of selflessness actually goes back to being a good... What I was saying earlier, a bit of giver, not a taker. Yeah. The givers will inherit the earth. Okay, in this new world. So if we go all the way back to the beginning, we were talking about how do you make things happen? And what we're saying is that it's a new world. Old world, you made things happen through people you control. New world, you have to make things happen through people you don't control. So now you have to learn a whole set of new behaviours so that you can get everyone working for you, even if they don't, even if you don't control them which is a much, so leadership used to be a largely rational exercise. It's now much more political and much more emotional. And you've got to be able to you know, manage on those dimensions as well. So it makes it harder, but actually now you can massively amplify yeah. your formal power through informal power in ways you could never do before. And that's what is kind of differentiating the best leaders from the merely very good, especially in the middle of the organisation. The middle people are still sort of clinging to this is my span of control, these are my decision making rights, this is my budget, and that's kind of okay. That's all right, you know. 
but it's but you know it's limited yeah. the best ones but well that's that is simply yeah my my entry ticket into the race and now i'm going to massively amplify that through the building these networks of influence and trust on all these alliances well, that's a and real people who really and those are the people who really make things happen that's a real shift isn't it going from it's the first it's a revolution and, so, and some managers get it and some don't it's yeah. a basic basic thing which is great because if you're one of the managers that do get it you're going to accelerate your career massively because a lot of your colleagues don't get it i mean they'll have heard all the rhetoric about yeah, you know, it's a new world's work and all that kind of buzzwords. stuff. All the buzzwords, but all the buzzwords are missing the point. All the stuff about AI and hybrid work is interesting, and it is changing the world of leadership and management. But actually, the real change is in the nature of power within the organisation. And power used to be this vertical thing, and it used to be all formal. Now it's vertical and lateral and informal, and that. And you know, it's going from make things happen through people you control, make things happen through people you don't control. Complete game changer. And the people who really get that and understand how to make that work for them, especially in the middle of the organisation, are the people who will really go places. Um, you can still have a good career if you're on the you know, more traditional side. That's fine. But yeah, it's, it, you're going to limit yourself. So the whole world seems to be going through flux, change, pandemic, yeah. political upheaval, yeah. economies. Uh, the whole thing, you know, is is kind of up in the air right now. I think it's obvious to say leadership is more important yeah. than ever before. Um, yeah. I've only got a limited lifespan in terms of what I've seen before. But what's... You know, if there's one thing that you think, you know, if leaders just did this thing, that's going to make a small but useful difference to people around them, what would it be? Okay, look, first of all, we're talking about leadership. Lots of people talk about leadership. Lots of gurus talk about leadership. Lots of people write books about leadership. That's an interesting thing. How many people actually define what leadership is? I look at a lot of these books and a lot of these gurus, they talk endlessly about it and they never define it. And if you can't define it, how can you do you it? literally do not know what you are talking about. Okay. So before we talk about this, let's let's try and define leadership. And I've looked at many, many definitions. The only one which works, and this is going to answer your question, the only one which works for me uh, comes from Henry Kissinger. You know, the Secretary of State, uh, uh, now deceased. Um, and I'm not sure where he stole it from. But anyway, here is his definition. Very simple. Leaders take people where they would not have got by themselves. It's not boring. This is Kissinger, right? It's devious. And actually, it is revolutionary and empowering. So let's unpack it. Leaders take people where they would not have got by themselves. First up, that's defining leaders by what they do, not by their position. Yeah. That's the revolution. Yeah. So there are plenty of leaders at the top of organisations with grand titles like prime minister, president, chief executive, whatever, but they're not leading. They're simply sort of managing a legacy that they inherited or they're following the focus groups. They're following public opinion. If you're following public opinion, you are not leading it. No. OK, so lots of leaders at the top fail that test. There are lots of people lower in the organisation who absolutely are, yeah, absolutely they are leaders. So I was in, let me give you an example. I was in hospital for a, for a while having an um, operation I'd rather not have again. Thank you very much. Um, so... Uh, because I see everything through the lens of leadership, I was, of course, looking at what was going on the, uh, around me in the ward through the lens of leadership, right? So I started interviewing some of the porters. 
And there was one porter who was really interesting. He said, well, yeah, he said, it's interesting. He said, you know, we were having a real problem because all the wheelchairs are in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. And if the wheelchairs are in the wrong place, then that means that we can't get patients to the operating theatre on time and we can't you know, get people around into the different wards and it's all a complete mess. But that was the system. We weren't allowed to change it. So I got the other porters together and we said, look, this is a complete mess. What are we going to do about it? And we thought about it and we had a cup of tea, you know, tea cup theory of leadership. And we worked out there was a much better way of organising all the wheelchairs so that they'd be in the right place at the right time. And that would actually free up capacity in the operating theatres and we'd, you know, reduce problems on the wards. But there was a problem that management wouldn't let us do it. So we thought about what we do. And we thought, well, I'll just do it anyway. Yeah. So we just did it. And management went berserk. Why? Because we'd broken their rules until oh. they realised it was working. But then they did it was their idea. Uh, <laughs> you can't write it, can you? <laughs> that is, so, yeah, by title, hospital porter, but actually, by nature, leader, true leader. Yeah, he was taking people and the organisation where we'd not have got by ourselves. So we come back to your 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 question, yeah, what is the one thing that a leader can do? One thing a leader has to do, and it differentiates them from managers and everyone else, is take people where they would not have got by themselves. Okay, So ingredient number one of that is, well, if you're being grand, we can call it a vision. It's actually just... Purpose. A, vision is, a vision is simply a story in three parts. Here it is, right? Um, this is where we are, this is where we're going, and this is how we're going to get there, right? That's a vision. Oh, and if you want to make it really motivational, you add a fourth part, which is, and this is your really important role in helping us get there. Oh, good, okay. Um, so, yeah, we may not have a vision, but we can all tell a simple story about this is where we are, this is where we're going, this is how we're going to get there. So be really clear about this is where we're going to go. This is how I'm going to make a difference. So ask yourself, how am I going to make a difference this year or over the next two years? How am I going to remember this year? Mm-hmm. There are years I look back on, and I can't remember what I did. Yeah. Now, if you can't remember a year, then all you achieved was to get one year close to death. Well, that's not a great achievement, is it? It's a waste. So, and it... How are you going to remember it? How are you going to make a difference? And how are you going to be remembered? This is a really interesting question. So as a little test, what I do with the groups is I say, right, try and remember, list out as many prime ministers as you can going backwards into history. Okay? Okay. As far as you can. And inevitably you find that there, there are a few gaps where people go, well, I don't know who was prime minister. So you, know, you go, well, that, that's not much of, of an achievement if people can't even remember that you're prime minister. And then kind of say, okay, you've got your list, you know, complete or incomplete. Now, what do you rem- remember each prime minister for? And invariably, it's not how the prime minister would want to be remembered. It's like for something they said, like events, dear boy, events, or white heat of the technology revolution, or something stupid they did, like, you know, the dodgy dossier in the Iraq war, or you know, Sailor Ted, you know, and he's sailing and piano playing or uh, it's it is it kind of, that's how you get, okay? So, how are you going to be around? Nice. Right? How are you going to be around? The chances, now, if you're lucky, you do get remembered for doing something dramatic, right? So, Atley, welfare state, bing, yeah. done that. Yeah. Thatcher, Thatcherism, you may love it or hate it, but, you know, Everyone remembers her for that, okay? There's a legacy, good or bad. There's a legacy, which everyone lives with, okay? Fine. So congratulations. All the others tend to get remembered for how they were, not for what they did, but for how they were. And think about your own bosses that you've had. Think about the teachers you've had. You probably can't remember, you know, what that maths lesson was actually all about. You can't remember the brilliant bit of maths thing that, you know, you're teaching Mm -hmm. I ask you, what was that your te- math teacher like? 
go, oh, boy, you're well, she, well, she was like this and this, and oh, I can tell, oh. Blah, blah, blah. So how are you going to get that? You're going to be remembered, probably, not for what you did. You're not going to get remembered for beating budget in 2024 by 6.7%. Sorry, forget that. I mean, you need to do that, but that's not how you're going to get remembered. You're going to be remembered for how you are. So think about that. And how do you want to be remembered? And if that's how you want to be remembered, then make sure you act that way. I'm not sure how we got onto that, but anyway, we ramble. We, We're writing we that script now, aren't we? <laughs> we? Whether we like it or not, we're writing the script the whole time. So, I mean, every little thing you do makes a difference. Let me give you one tiny example. I was walking into uh, the office one day. Yeah, actually, I wasn't. My feet were walking into the office and my <laughs> body was following. Yeah, I was on complete autopilot. Yeah. And I posh, passed a very posh office building and there were doormen sitting, uh, standing outside with brown and white shoes and two tan shoes. And I went, oh, and those says, I just went, love those shoes. He said, oh, thank you, sir. He was, he was really happy. Yeah. Rush hour later, that, and actually, his his response made me feel good. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Made me feel so I went into the office, oh buzzing and good, and suddenly everyone else was being nice to me because I was being nice to them, and it was a good day. All because of that two-turn shoes comment. On the way back in the rush hour, the doorman spotted me. He said, When was your day, sir? Yeah. I went, it was great. He said, You know what? Mine was too. Small thing. Small every Every little tiny thing you do can have a huge impact. Huge impact. And it's not about making big gestures. It's just... The small things, I mean, it's, it's often overstated, but the small things can make a difference. But I think we comply sometimes and we don't think we can... Nice shoes. We can't say that in case they misread our intention. Exactly. A bit of courage, going back to one of your earlier points, a bit of courage and, you know, doing something yeah. a little bit different. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I'm just, yeah, absolutely. I, and, yeah, the worst thing is I go, mm, like that. Yeah, all right, fine. I'll That's share this with you, Joe. Don't think badly of me, but I'll share this thing that I used to do. I haven't done it for a while. I haven't done this since the pandemic. But you know what it's like? You're staying in a hotel for business. Yeah. You're all going down to reception, you know, with the rest of the hotel guests around the same sort of time in the day between eight. Yeah. yeah. Again, the, in the lift, the lift is full. Uh, and uh, one day it struck me, everyone's just looking at the ceiling or looking at the floor. There's no eye contact. Everyone's just in their own space, just trying to get through the morning. Yeah. So one morning I, I went in and I've done it a few times. And the doors opened, lift full of people, a space just big enough for me. I'd walk in, doors closed behind me. And then that said, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I guess you're wondering why I've called this meeting today. And the reaction was just a joy. People were like, what's going on? Exactly. Then they realized it's just a bit of silliness. And they smiled and laughed. And everyone got up. Most people got out uh, of the lift with a smile on their face. And it's just like, you know, probably something they forgot, maybe something they spoke about. But Well, you see, what, what you've just done there is a classic answer to the question, which I sometimes ask groups, which is, what is the culture of a lift? Oh. Everyone goes, oh, what? What do you mean? There is a culture. Oh. Right. And there are very clear rules about what you do and what you don't do when you get into a lift. So if you went into a lift and looked everyone in the eye and said, and off to shake their hands and say, hello, my name is so and so, you know, what do you do and how much do you earn? I guarantee by the next, you know, by the next floor, you'd have the lift to yourself. OK. <laughs> um, ditto on the tube train or whatever it is. You know, yeah. There are very clear rules about. You know, where how you go in, where you stand, where you look, you know, what you say or don't say. Has anyone ever written those rules down? Mm -hmm. No. Are those rules absolutely clear? Oh, yes. So um, another little example of this. Um, I was, you know, I built a business in Japan. I was uh, 
out to dinner with uh, the head of a uh, senior director from Mitsubishi, which has a turnover in size of Switzerland. And we got to the stage of the evening where we were drunk, where you're allowed to say the truth, right? Yeah. And all will be forgiven the next day. So that's sort of part of the culture there. And he turns to me and says, Joe, he said, a question I want to ask. I go, go. I'm now getting, we're now getting to the real business of the evening. It's good, you know. He says, I go, yes, what is it? He says, Joe, he says, oh, do you shake hands? I went, what? <laughs> now, in Japan, I'm like, how do you bow? Because the bowing, I mean, there's uh, there are real rules about who bows deepest, longest, and first. I mean, and this is important stuff. And they are rules. I mean, you know, um, you can define them. But now, try explaining to someone how you shake hands. Who do you shake hands with? When do you shake hands? How do you know they're ready to shake hands? How long do you shake hands for? What do you say when you're shaking hands? Da, 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 da. I don't know. What are the rules? We know the rules because we've sort of done it. Oh, and don't get me on to kissing, please. <laughs> um, what are the rules if you're Japanese it's completely mysterious mm -hmm. so culture is this really interesting stuff where it's pervasive and it, you have to follow the rules but what are the rules I don't know and this matters for leaders because every firm has completely different sets of rules about what works, what doesn't work, how you're meant to behave, etc. And if you don't, if you don't, you know, follow those rules, you're toast. So there is a lot of leadership which is highly, highly uh, contextual. Um, we talked about you know, courage earlier. That's also contextual. You know, uh, the great explorer who could do, you know, spend his life on the Arctic ice pack or. or uh, in the desert, but would die die selling double glazing. You know, the rules are completely different ever, everywhere. So one of your tasks, probably the first task you've got as a potential leader is to discover the context in which you will flourish. Okay. And, and that's actually really hard. And, explain, and it does explain why um, there's huge churn in the labour market in the first few years of people's careers because people are bouncing from one job to another to find out well what what is the context that i'll actually uh succeed on and th and that's not a sign of weakness or a problem with the new generation it's it's actually a healthy sign that people go well I, I just need to discover where i will where i will thrive try before they buy. sorry try before they buy exactly exactly so um Sorry, I'm, I'm happy got onto that, but anyway. That's okay. Ugh, I'm enjoying the conversation. I mean, you know, this isn't a, a script, is it? Earlier on, uh, you mentioned about tribes. Yep. Tell me a bit about that. Well, tribes are interesting. Okay, so look, when, when I look at leadership, I don't look at it through a single lens. I look at it through every single conceivable lens. So, yeah, I yes, I interview corporate types right around the world uh, in every industry. I've also, uh, yeah, work with special forces, um, spies, nuclear deterrent explorers, um, political prisoners, prime ministers, you name it. But one area I've spent 15 years hanging out with tribes around the world, okay, from uh, Mali to Mongolia, Arctic to Australia, Papua New Guinea and beyond, all that kind of good stuff. Why? Why would I do something stupid like that? Well, the reality is that most tribes have survived far longer than most businesses will. Um, the half-life of a firm in the S&P 500 is, I think, now down to 15 years. A tribe which only survives at 15 years is not a successful tribe. Let's be clear about that. It doesn't even become a tribe. It doesn't even become, exactly. So number one, they've survived a lot longer. Number two, they've survived with far fewer resources. Um, so yeah, most leaders, we're, we're both imprisoned and enabled by all those corporate life support systems that we love to hate, you know, be it finance, HR, legal, IT, etc. All that stuff straight out the window. Health and safety, ha, huh? yeah. yeah, made me laugh, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, 
tribal leadership is leadership without a safety net. Okay. And finally, uh, they survive in far harsher conditions. Okay. So quite often they're facing we have the reality of drought, famine, disease, and of course, uh, increasingly the ubiquitous Kalashin, Kalashnikovs or Kalashinkovs, as they call them, um, which can cause real, real problems. So when they talk about, we talk about corporate warfare, when they talk about tribal warfare, believe you me, the, you know, the blood gets shed and it's, it's serious. So um, these people have survived for far longer with far fewer resources in far harsher conditions than most businesses. So maybe, just maybe, we can learn something from them. So if I just give you, I'm, I'm not going to give you everything because, of course, that's a couple Here's of books. Uh, let me talk about maybe three things. Um, what makes a good leader? Um, strategy and change. Okay, so three things. First of all, what makes a good leader? Um, I was going around with one tribe. And they always said, well, the three things we look for were our courage, contribution, and responsibility. I'd ask the elders, I'd ask the warriors, I'd ask the women, I'd ask the children. They all came back to the same things, courage, contribution, responsibility. It was so consistent that I kind of expected to go into one of the mud huts and see one of those sort of posters of people <laughs> growing up. In their Accessories. Or, exactly. Or, or, or a sort of little video of a little video. <laughs> Courage, contribution, response. But of course, they don't have posters, they don't have videos, they don't have anything. But they do have great clarity about this. I was sort of kind of feeling a bit cynical about this. Actually, it was a, this tribe, this Lycopia, uh, internet armed person, not wearing uh, uh, plastic roses in his head, just for the sake of clarity. Um, and uh, I was out patrolling the territory one day with uh, the chief and a couple of uh, younger uh, wannabe warriors. And suddenly and, and these were probably like 10 12 years old something like that um 12 years old and then suddenly out of the bush over there came a pack of hyenas Ooh. charging at us at full speed what would you do what would you do well i did what any sensible coward would do i i hid behind the chief and warriors on the base that they'd get killed first and then i could sort of run away um warriors proceeded to laugh in the face of imminent death, which did strike me as one reason they were warriors, and I wasn't. And the cause of their laughter became clear a moment later, because out of that same bit of bush came a small child with an even smaller stick chasing the hyenas. Like, no. Watch. Now, what had been going on was that child had been protecting the goats of the village. The entire wealth of the village. Interesting exercise oh. in delegation, isn't it? And that child knew from years, from generations of cultural indoctrination that you protect those goats at all costs. So what did the child do when, when the hyenas appeared? Did the child run back to the village to convene the hyena subcommittee of the wildlife management committee in <laughs> full plenary session to pass a vote of most no confidence in the hyenas. No. The child picked up a stick, went for the hyenas, and actually hyenas knew they'd met their match, so they scarped. Okay. So what what was that I was saying about courage? Okay. What was I saying about contribution? Tick. What was I saying about responsibility? Tick. But, and again. I can go yeah, into the Highlands of Papua New Guinea, exactly the same story uh, uh, of a wonderful leader there, Sir Joseph Nombre, who, who did exactly the same courage contribution response. Where, wherever, and I won't tell you, to, oh, yeah, the stories take too long. They're wonderful stories, but take too long. But wherever I go, I find the same thing. So you go, well, all right, that's great. So actually, leadership there is, is values-based leadership in the tribes. Because they, they don't have MBAs and all that sort of, but they do have yeah, values. Yeah. So, what about the? You know, are those the right values for businesses? Well, I don't know. I don't know is the answer. Um, courage is good. We talked about that. Yeah. Having leaders who give rather than take—that's not bad. And yeah. uh, having leaders who take responsibility, not just for the good stuff, but the bad stuff as well—that's good. So, you know, that pretty good uh, set of values. 
I'd argue that actually other sets of values are fine, but what matters is that they are lived values, okay? So I'm not interested in values that appear on a brass plaque. I see lots of firms that have eight, nine, 10, 12 values. That is again, pure meadow mayonnaise because no one can even remember those values, let alone act on them. Three values at most and be relentless about acting on them. And when you look at all the initiation ceremonies, gruesome initiation ceremonies that they go through, that a lot of it is about both testing and reinforcing the values. Are you, do you belong? Do you belong or not? So values do actually matter hugely for leaders. That's first lesson. Okay. Let's talk about competitive strategy. Um, tribes really understand this. They really understand this because there is cattle raiding. So how do you raid cattle? Well, the answer is you wait until all the men in the neighboring village have disappeared off to do their bit of cattle herding or whatever it is, and then you attack. Because the last thing you want is a fair fight. Mm. The problem with a fair fight is you might lose it. Yes. So tribal warfare is always designed to be inherently unfair. In sense, they try and avoid warfare because most of the time you know, they want good neighbours. And if they do do a raid, they do it far away because you don't want hang neighbours. Okay. Um, but if you do fight, you make sure it is an unfair fight because you don't want to lose. Okay. So that's the essence of corporate competitive strategy. And actually most businesses, you look at most successful businesses, they all have a thoroughly unfair source of competitive advantage. You know, they've got nearly a monopoly on desktop operating systems, or they have the, the best grounds for, uh, digging oil or they've got yeah um you know the the license for uh doing water in in your area or for uh cable tv or whatever it is yeah they've got some degree of they've got big barriers but they can hide behind and actually the competitive intensity is is low okay the so final lesson from tribes is perhaps the most interesting it's about change when you look at tribes, you think, well, you know, they've been there forever. Um, but actually, every tribe I've looked at is a tribe in transition, because they have to be. They have to be. Um, part of that is climate change. So a lot of these tribes are suddenly finding that, you know, their traditional way of life uh, is at risk from climate change, even, even when I was herding the reindeer in northern in the Arctic in northern Norway, um, even the reindeer are suffering from this. They're having to, you know, the, so their, their migration is moving by weeks at either end of the season, and that's causing all sorts of havoc about how they then actually survive and breed and all that kind of good stuff. And it's a, a story that's repeated everywhere. So that's one set of challenges. The emergence of Kalashnikovs, everywhere and that changes the rules of the game massively um and makes you know in increases the risks and then of course you know that there's the thing that these tribal people see us with cars and televisions and yeah. computers they well actually we want some of that yeah. you know so yeah if you can get a motorbike that's transformative but just one little example um in Papua New Guinea, uh, I was working with a tribe there in the highlands. They're largely subsistence, but they do need a little bit of cash for sort of buying buying stuff. And their one cash crop is a bit of coffee that they grow, coffee beans. But they have a problem. They're, they're one day walk, uh, a day's walk away from one of two towns, each of which has one big coffee buyer, only one coffee buyer. So it's kind of like, now, guess what? The coffee buyer sees these tribal people come and they know that the, there's no way those tribal people are going to walk all the way back to their village with the coffee on their backs. They're going to want to sell the coffee and they're the only buyer in town. So guess what? 
they get ripped off. Bottom dollar. Yep, bottom dollar. You've got it. So then one day I go back to the village and I look at one, one of the top on top of the chief's hut and there's a small solar panel. And I go, what's that about? I go, oh, it's for charging the uh, phone, the phone for the whole village. Okay. So, but you don't get reception here. I said, but we, if we walk to the top of the mountain, which is only about an hour, we do get reception. So well, what, what are you using it for? He said, oh, well, he said, that's easy. <laughs> Every time we want to sell any coffee, yeah. we check the price of coffee on the London market. Yeah. And then we call the two town, towns and say, right, you know, what are you going to offer us? So before we go off, we know what the price is going to be and we know what we're going to do. And that has, literally that one pound has doubled. The genius. Time. Genius. Super. So every tribe you look at is a tribe in transition. Sometimes because they want to, you know, the coffee buyers, and sometimes because they have to, climate change and clash the coffee. But they're all changing, okay? Time. Um, another tribe, just a yeah, little example, I got them to draw their uh, life history, well, the, the, the elder to draw his life history. It was kind of bloodbath of him sort of killing all the wild animals and having fights and all that kind of good stuff. And then at the end of it, he was looking after all the animals. And I go, Shalingi, what on earth has gone on? You know, you spent your whole life killing animals and now you're looking after them. What's happening? He said, well, you know, it's easy. We had a drought for four years and we realised that if all the animals die, we die too. So we've got to change from hunting animals to basically uh, becoming pastoralists and looking after animals. Um, that is a, um, in corporate strategy terms, that's a complete 180 degree change. Okay. So these tribes, it's not trivial change. It's often very big change. So the question for you, your corporate tribe is, how far are you changing? How far are you really changing? Or are you changing to survive or not? What a message. Change or die. That's the message from these tribes. If they don't change, they do die. Change or die. Simple as that. That's... Um... That's sobering, isn't it? Because those people live yep. at the mercy of nature. Uh, so, so they really have to. I think and it's so only, yeah, the answer is that most businesses don't change. Okay, So that is why the half-life of a firm in the S&P 500 is down to 15 years. Uh, the FTSE 100 was formed, I think, in 1984. So that's, what, 40 years ago. That's a long generation ago. You know, the top 100 firms that we were all meant to emulate and look up to, how many of those original 100 are still in the top 100? Last time I looked, I think it was 23. Wow. Right. So that is all the others have been either been taken over or overtaken. Okay. So again, if you know 70 or 80% of the tribes disappear within 40 years, that is not a success. Okay, so everyone talks the rhetoric of change, mm. but actually when you say, have you changed enough to survive? The answer is normally no. That's the real answer. So um, that's a real leadership challenge. I, yeah, are, are you going to change? So the tribes teach us a lot about what it takes to be a leader. It's, it's not just skills, it's values. Uh, the art of competitive strategy, seek the unfair advantage and change, change or die. Plenty of other lessons as well. Um, but those are three good ones to start with. Joe, you've been amazing. Genuinely. I mean, what a life lived. You've had some experiences, haven't you? Yeah, well, you know, you just sort of, I don't know, it all happens. <laughs> I'm humbled. I mean, That's right. well, thank you for having me. Do you know, it's been... Uh, I never know what we're going to end up talking about on these podcasts, Point of Leadership. This has been right out there. It really has. Right. Joe, thank you for your time. That was great. Well, thank you. And, you know, I hope we get to meet in person someday. That would be wonderful. Have tea. 